the Lord's Prayer. We use that title to commonly refer to the prayer that we find in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 8. Many of us have probably memorized that prayer. Oftentimes, we memorize it in the King James with uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It is by far one of the best known prayers in all of Scripture. We sing this passage. We recite it often in unison as group prayer. It's a beautiful prayer that is known and loved by many. While we know the words probably very well, do we really truly appreciate and understand what it is that we are told in this passage? The reality is, it's been a, a bit mislabeled. It's not truly the Lord's Prayer. It's more aptly described as the Disciples' Prayer. Because this passage is not actually a prayer that Jesus himself prayed. Rather, it's a model that Jesus gave to his disciples so that we might know how to pray. In fact, John's chapter 17 might more accurately be titled as the Lord's Prayer because that chapter contains a wonderful prayer of Jesus on the final night of his life on earth. But rather we call this the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, it is a wonderfully meaningful and deep text. For it is in these verses that our Lord provides us a model for how it is that we are to pray. Now, this prayer is not intended to be used as the only prayer you ever utter in your life. It is not is to be the only words we ever see. Remember earlier in verse 7, Jesus warned us about meaningless repetition. So we aren't to repeat exactly these words thinking this is the only way we can ever pray. Now, there is certainly nothing wrong with reciting or reading this passage as a prayer as long as we understand what it means and as long as our heart matches that which we are saying. But as we study this morning, we are doing so to glean principles for how to pray, seeking to apply it to our own lives so that we might understand how to pray as our Lord instructed us. Now, when we talk about prayer, there is something that needs to be briefly addressed. And that is, we need to understand what prayer is. Prayer is speaking directly to God. Prayer is not being silent before God. It's not waiting for God to speak to us. When Jesus tells us to pray in this way in Matthew, the word that he uses in Greek is prosukomai. Prosukomai is a word often, most often used for prayer in the New Testament. It means to pray, to petition God to do something, to address God. To pray to God is to speak to God, whether that be audibly or silently. It involves our addressing our Lord. Now that might sound rather basic to say that prayer is speaking to God, but in light of some modern movements, it's important that we clarify this as we begin to speak of what it means to pray. Because there's an approach to prayer that's being pushed in many circles uh, that is known by a few different names, but it's often referred to as contemplative prayer. Some of you might be familiar with that term, some may not. It is a mystical approach to prayer that teaches that prayer is not really speaking to God or using words at all, rather it's sitting in silence waiting for God to speak to you. And those who endorse this approach often make the claim that contemplative prayer was practiced by Jesus and the apostles. They often claim and assert that such an approach to prayer is actually the highest form of prayer, that we are to sit in silence waiting before God. And if you do, you can achieve new heights in your spiritual walk. There are books out. There are instructional DVDs that will tell believers to use breathing exercises in your prayer, to imagine as you breathe the Holy Spirit is coming into you or flowing out, and He's breathing life into you as you breathe in. They teach that the way to pray is to focus on a small verse or recite the same passage or word over and over and over again, waiting for God to speak to you. The goal of this so-called approach to prayer is to experience what they refer to as the manifest presence of God. Some even endorse using really mantras, even saying the name of Jesus over and over and over again. Many suggest that the key to this type of prayer is to turn your mind off. Just let your subconscious commune with the Lord. They teach the more you get out of the way, the better your prayer life will be. Now, I bring this up because contemplative prayer is not found in the Scripture at all. And when the Bible talks about we are to pray in this way, it's never referring to what those today would refer to as contemplative prayer. Prayer in the Scripture is never about emptying your mind. It's never about being silent, and it's never about repeating a mantra. Such practices come out of Eastern pagan religions. They have nothing to do with biblical Christianity. 
And those who endorse this type of praying say the purpose of prayer is not to ask God for anything, but to experience his presence. But that's not the purpose of biblical prayer, ever. The word pray means to petition, to address God. And there is no, no prayer you will find in the Bible that doesn't involve speaking, either verbally or mentally, to the Lord. We cannot pray without speaking to Him. And every time prayer is discussed in the Scripture, or modeled in the Scripture, it involves talking, a discussion with the Lord. Contemplative prayer is not only unbiblical in that it's not found in the Bible, it's actually anti-biblical. In fact, that it endorses concepts and practices that go against what the Scripture tells us. Now, certainly biblical meditation is important, but that is meditating and studying a passage. It is not emptying your mind. And we are never commanded to seek a vision or to try to seek a personal revelation or a word from the Lord. We are never to empty our minds. We're never called upon to repeat a word over and over and over again. In fact, remember, Jesus warned about such a mindless repetition already in the Sermon on the Mount. Such an approach to prayer is to have no place in a believer's life. Contemplative prayer is just a New Age approach to prayer that's sadly finding its way into many mainstream evangelical churches and Christian bookstores. But such an approach is not found in the Scripture. So if you know someone who is practicing this or you yourself have been taught that, please be aware that that approach to prayer is not biblical. That's not what the Lord is talking about here. If you have any questions about it, please be sure and see me after the service. But as we study the words of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount on how to pray, we will observe this is the model we are to follow in praying as believers in Jesus Christ. And you will notice there is nothing here about contemplative prayer. Jesus doesn't say, pray in this way, empty your mind, be silent, sit and chant. That's not what he says. He says, pray in this way, and then he gives us the words that we are to use as we express our hearts to the Lord. Prayer is communicating with the Lord. It's using our words and speaking to Him. And the promise of His Holy Word is that when we pray in this way, He responds. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We pick it up in verse 9 this morning. Jesus says, Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A few observations in general about the model that is provided for us here as we begin. Notice there are six requests shared in this prayer. The first three focus on the Lord and the last focus with our needs. Notice the repetition of your three times in the first half of the prayer. And the word us is used four times in the last half of the prayer. Now that's not on accident. There is purpose and a plan for the way this prayer is structured. And it's a powerful reminder to us that prayer is first and foremost to be focused on God. It's first to be about His interest and His glory. And then secondly, we address our concerns and our needs. This observation will provide us for an outline as we study this prayer. Today we're going to focus on the first half of the prayer. How prayer should be focused on the Lord. And then next week we'll focus on the last half of this prayer that focuses on our needs. Notice the command here is to pray in this way. So then we see this is a model for our prayer. This is a guide for all disciples of Jesus Christ on how it is that we should pray. And what is interesting is not only what our Lord says, but what He doesn't say here in the model to pray. Notice there is no instruction on where we must pray. There's no geographic place given, no specific place mentioned. He doesn't say pray only in the temple, pray only in a church building, pray only with other believers. Now earlier in the passage, he told his disciples, go into your inner room to pray, as he stressed the necessity of private prayer. But now he doesn't limit prayer to only being in private. We are to pray in private as well. We are to pray in public, as we are instructed in 1 Timothy 2. Notice also Jesus doesn't provide a specific time of the day in which we are to pray. He doesn't say do this three times a day, do it five times a day, do it once a day, do it before every meal. He doesn't say when we are to pray in this way. What the scripture does tell us in other places is that we are to be praying at all times without ceasing. So then this is a model that can be followed in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, anytime we come to the Lord in prayer. Notice also, Jesus doesn't provide instructions for a specific posture we are to use when we pray. 
We can pray with our eyes open, standing, looking towards the heavens. We can pray kneeling down with our eyes folded or our eyes closed and our hands folded. Prayer can take place in any posture, in any situation. God hears us as you pray driving down the road. Hopefully your eyes are open in such instances. And he hears you also as you kneel beside your bed in the privacy of your own room. Posture is not what is key here to praying the way that Jesus tells us to pray. Rather, what is key is the way in which we communicate to our Father. And that's what we see here in this model of prayer that we are given. It focuses on the content of our prayer, not on the location or the posture we have as we pray. We are reminded here that the focus of our prayers are, in fact, to be on the Lord. Prayer is not about trying to get God to do what we want Him to do. It's a discussion where we pour out our hearts in worship to Him. We proclaim His attributes and we affirm our willingness to serve Him. And certainly we seek His face to deal with our difficulties and our trials. But prayer is about bringing our request to Him, but it's more than just bringing requests to the Lord. And before we bring our request, we need to spend time focused in worship and acknowledgement of who He is and our relationship to Him. And that's what we see as we look at our passage this morning. We're continuing our study through the Sermon on the Mount. Remember what we've seen so far. This is a sermon that was delivered by Jesus to His disciples on a mountainside in Galilee. An introduction to Christianity. Instructions for His disciples on what it meant to follow Him. And he now he turns his attention to instruct his disciples on the proper way to pray. As prayer is such a large part of our Christian walk, it's important that we know the proper way to pray. And we need to understand what he says to us here. So as we study this passage this morning, we are looking for how it is that we can pray better. How we can pray the way the Lord would have us to pray. Not just the way perhaps we have been taught or have always prayed in the past. We want to make sure that the way we approach our Heavenly Father is in line with what we've been told here. To pray as Jesus would have us pray, we see first in verse 9 that our prayer must be based on our relationship with the Lord. In verse 9 again, Jesus says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven. We are told we are to address our prayers to our Father who is in heaven. That opening phrase contains a wealth of information on how we are to pray. First, we observe that we, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are those who have a real and authentic relationship with our God. We are able to address Him as Heavenly Father. And that is an incredible privilege. Remember, Jesus is speaking to His disciples. He's speaking to those who have already put their faith in Him. We use that phrase, Father, so often, we can forget how revolutionary that was when Jesus taught this in Galilee. Because in the first century, Jews didn't consider God as their personal father. They didn't refer to him in that way. They would refer to God as the father of Israel, the father of the nation, but they didn't think of him as their personal father. And this is a wonderful and precious aspect of our relationship that Jesus revealed and explained to us. And we see throughout the New Testament, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we enter into a personal relationship with God. Our creator is known as our father. Remembering who God is and how we relate to Him is so important as we pray. Because we come not just before the sovereign Creator, the almighty ruler of the universe, and He certainly is that, but we also come to our Father. The Greek word that's used here is pater. It means father. It was a term of respect. It was a formal way to address a parent or a leader. In Romans, Paul uses the word Abba as he describes how our hearts cry out to the Lord. And Abba was the more informal term, uh, the term a child would use for his father. In English, we would say daddy. As believers in Jesus, we relate to God as our father. We are to do so with respect as we pray to our heavenly father. But we also recognize at the same time that he truly is our dad. He is our personal father. And that is a precious and wonderful truth. When we pray, we are speaking to God. We are speaking to the one whom has said that he is our father. We are praying to one who loves us without limits. One who cares for us unconditionally. He is the perfect father. That means he is always attentive to our prayers. He listens and he wants to interact with us. He cares for us. He protects us. And he ensures that our needs are provided for. In fact, a little later in this sermon, Jesus would say this in Matthew 7. Or what man is there among you who when he asks his son for a loaf will give him a stone? 
See, knowing that God is our Father gives us the assurance that He will provide for our needs. He wants the best for us. No matter what it might feel at times, He is not out to get us. He is not wanting to make our life miserable. He's not wanting us to fail. He loves us. And when we need a loaf of bread, He is not going to give us stones because He is our perfect Heavenly Father. And when you truly believe this reality, it changes the way you approach prayer. Because we understand that we are speaking to our Heavenly Father, one who cares for us and has our best interest at heart. It also means that prayer is limited to those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Because only those who have come to faith in Jesus can truly address God as their Father. And if you are here this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus, then you can't honestly pray this way because God is not yet your Father. But He can be if you come to Him in faith. And you can do so even this very day. And if you'd like to speak to somebody about how you can put your faith in Jesus and become a son of the King, then please speak to me after the service. We also note that our prayers are to be addressed primarily to the Father. Notice Jesus doesn't say, pray to me. He doesn't say, pray to the Holy Spirit. The normal means of our prayers are to be directed to the Father. As believers, we pray first and primarily to the Father. Now we know from the rest of Scripture that as we pray to the Father, we come in the power of the Holy Spirit. We come in the name and through the blood of our Savior, Jesus, the Son. And we know the reality that our God is a triune God, three persons and yet one in essence. And so while we primarily direct our prayers to the Father, it's not sinful, it's not wrong to speak to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. We're told this in John 14, 14. Jesus said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And then a little later he said, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And so we see that we can ask Jesus for help and he promises to give it. We can ask the Father for help and he promises to grant it. Certainly the Holy Spirit is a person. We're told that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, and so there's nothing wrong for seeking forgiveness when we grieve the Spirit of God. But there is no example in the Scripture of praying directly to the Holy Spirit. There's no example in the Scripture of asking the Spirit for anything directly. Normally our prayers are to be directed to the Father as Jesus directs us here. It's a model we see throughout the rest of Scripture as well. Therefore, it is necessary to know God as Father if we are to pray as Jesus instructs. And it's on the basis of that relationship that we come to Him. So then to pray as the Lord instructs here means we must first have a personal relationship with the Lord. And it means that our prayers are based upon the reality of that relationship. We are not praying to some distant deity who cares little for us or who does not even know our name. We are speaking with our Heavenly Father. He loves us. He cares for us. And that is of great comfort when we come to Him in prayer. Prayer is not an idle exercise that is meaningless. It is interaction with our Father. As Jesus continues, we see our next principle, that as we pray. As we pray, we are also to have the proper respect. Look at the end of verse 9. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed is not a word we use too often in everyday conversation. Uh, the Greek word here is hagiadzo. It literally means to honor as holy. And so this could literally be translated, holy be your name. And that we get a little more sense of rather than hallowed. When we come to God, we must realize that He is holy. He is the one who is to be honored and worshipped, for He alone is the Holy One. Now, this is not a prayer, a request for God to become holy. He is already perfectly holy. Rather, this is a recognition of who God is. It's a request that His name be honored as holy in all that we do. This is to always be the primary attitude in our prayer, that we want God's name to be honored as holy. Everything we pray about, every request we bring before Him, should be for the ultimate purpose of His glory and His honor, because His name is holy. When the Scripture refers to God's name, it's a way of encompassing who He is, His person, His character. To honor His name is to honor Him. And conversely, to disgrace His name is to disgrace Him. That's why God's name is to be held in the highest of regard, because His name represents who He is. That's why one of the Ten Commandments is not to take the Lord's name in vain, because the name of God is a way of encompassing all that He is. And to show disrespect for His name is to show contempt for Him. To pray for His name to be holy is an expression that our desire is that He be honored in all that we do. It's a commitment that we would avoid doing anything that would bring dishonor or disgrace to His name. 
Now certainly that means we avoid using his name as a curse word or in some vulgar manner. It also means that we avoid using his name in an inappropriate manner, that we don't attribute things to him that should not be attributed to him. To honor his name means we seek to live our lives in accordance with his holy word. When we pray, Father, holy be your name, it's not only a request, but it's also a commitment that we make as his disciple. We are bowing our knee before him, acknowledging the reality that he is the Holy One. And at the same time, it's a way of committing ourselves that we will live for him. It's paying him the proper respect and the honor he deserves, recognizing that everything we do is to be for his glory. Now, this is at the very beginning of our prayer. And when you begin your prayers in this fashion, it ensures that your prayer keeps the right focus through the entirety of your prayer. Because it's rather hard to pray a selfish prayer if you begin by affirming your desire for God's name to be honored as holy. Because if you express that, and that is the truth of your heart, then all of your prayers will reflect that wondrous reality. When we recognize God is holy and it's our duty to honor Him as such, it helps keep our prayer life in perspective. It prevents us from praying about frivolous things or selfish things. It helps us ensure that we focus in on the most important realities of life. We are to have respect for the Lord as we come before Him. We don't come before Him flippantly. We don't come before Him irreverently. We are to begin our prayers with the recognition that He is the Holy One, committing ourselves to honor Him as such in all we do. That's what it means to pray, Hallowed be your name. It means holy be your name. I urge you to take some time to evaluate your own prayer life. Do you spend time declaring that He is holy in your daily prayers? Do you renew your commitment to Him regularly to regard His name as holy in your thoughts, in your words, and in your deeds? If so, then you are praying as our Lord would have you pray. But if not, then it might be some time to make some changes to the way you pray. As Jesus continues, we see our next principle. As we pray, we are also to be those who are anxious for His reign. Look at the beginning of verse 10. Your kingdom come. When we pray, Father, your kingdom come, we are asking the Lord to come and establish his kingdom on earth. This is not just a prayer for his spiritual kingdom to be established. This is a prayer that God would establish his physical kingdom, that he was established Messiah as king in Jerusalem, that he would reign over earth as is promised from the beginning of the Old Testament through the end of the New. It's a request that God's rule will be established over all the earth. And it expresses the desire that we want His kingdom to come. We desire for Him to come and eliminate sin, to eliminate hardship, to establish finally and ultimately His kingdom on earth. We see here that we are to pray on a regular basis that God will establish His kingdom. That is a prayer that is guaranteed to be answered yes. One day, maybe not in our lifetime, but it will one day be answered yes. Because God will one day bring His kingdom to earth. That day is coming. And there will come a day when the kingdom of men will cease. When all that will exist is the kingdom of God. We read of this in Revelation. Revelation 11, 15. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And He will reign forever and ever. This is the day we pray for. The day we long for it when we pray, Father, Your kingdom come. The day when Jesus will return to establish God's kingdom on earth. When His reign will be over all the earth. And it will be a time of peace and prosperity. His eternal reign will have no end. And that will be a glorious day indeed. That should be the desire of our hearts looking forward to that day. That's what we ask for as we pray, let your kingdom come. We are asking that that day would come quickly. We are echoing the words of John at the end of Revelation 22 when he says, come Lord Jesus. That is what we're saying when we say, your kingdom come. God's physical kingdom won't be established until Jesus returns. And so this is a request for the end of the ages, for Jesus to come again and establish God's kingdom. What we're told here is this is to be a regular part of our prayer life. As those who desire to see God glorified, to see His will completed, and to see His plan accomplished, we are to be those who approach our Heavenly Father on a regular basis with the understanding that He will be coming to set up His kingdom soon, and so we ask Him to do it quickly. When was the last time you prayed that? Most of our daily prayers don't involve asking God to come set up His kingdom. Um, we pray for many things, but I think oftentimes we forget to pray about this. We are taught here that we are to pray for His kingdom to come. 
But the reality is we get so busy sometimes with our own lives, with all that we have to do, with all the hustle and bustle, we forget there is more to come. And that ought not be. We are to be so consumed with God's glory and His presence, so focused on what is coming, that that is the natural extension of our daily prayer that we say, Lord, come, come even this day. We are never to get so comfortable in this world that we desire to stay here. We are to be longing for the day when His kingdom will come and Jesus will reign forevermore. And we're reminded of that if we're praying every day, Lord, Your kingdom come. It helps us get the right perspective to remember that God is coming back. So as we pray, we are to be anxiously awaiting for His reign, longing for the day when there will be no pain, no more heartache, and no more sin. Looking forward to the day when justice will reign and evil will be no more. We have the assurance of Scripture this day will come. And knowing that as we pray gives us hope and confidence. We have hope that the pain we endure today is only temporary. And we have the assurance that God's kingdom is coming. And as His disciples, we are to pray anxiously awaiting for His soon return. As we come to the last half of verse 10, we also see that we are to pray by submitting to His rule. Look at the end of verse 10. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Will is a translation of the Greek word thelema. It means desire or purpose or will. God's will refers to what He desires to take place. Now we know His will, we know His desires through carefully studying the Scripture. And so then when we pray for your will to be done, we are asking that His word be fulfilled, that His desires be followed. We are asking, in essence, for His will to be done in our lives. That means we are expressing the desire to live in obedience to His perfect will as it is revealed in His holy word. We ask that His will will take place on earth as it is in heaven. God's will and desire are always perfectly fulfilled in heaven. In heaven, there is no sin, there is no rebellion, there is no resistance. Whatever God desires happens immediately. And that's what we ask as we pray this, that our lives would be as receptive to God's will and His Word as all of heaven is. See, when we pray, God, Your will be done, it's an expressing a desire for the Lord to have His way first and foremost in my life. It's a statement of submission and humbleness to say, Your will be done in my life, O oh Lord. That is a prayer that is easy to say, much harder to mean it when you say it. Because it requires that you be willing to submit to that which is His will. And yet this is a prayer that we are told should be a regular part of our prayer life. Every day we should be praying this. Lord, Your will be done. Because the reality is true joy is found in seeing the Lord have His way in our life. To pray Your will be done is to submit to His authority in your life. It says, I recognize that your will and your desires come first, Lord. No matter what I may want, your will be done. That's what Jesus modeled, not only here, but he later put it into practice in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he struggled that night with the agony of the cross, as he dealt with the horror of all that was soon coming, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional agony, as he was about to face the horror of the cross, he prayed in the garden. Remember, he asked the Father if there was any other way to do what needed to be done. But every time, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. He put into practice what he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what it means to pray, Lord, your will be done. We bring our request before the Father. We pour out our hearts in open and honest communication to him. But we do so always with the understanding, Father, not my will, but yours be done. It's a reminder to us as you pray this way that we're not praying to some sort of heavenly ATM machine. God is not a genie in a lamp that if you rub him the right way or you say the right magical words, he's going to give you whatever it is that you ask of him. We are speaking to the sovereign Lord. We are speaking to the creator of the universe. We are speaking to our heavenly father. And so we must submit to his rule and his authority, recognizing he has all wisdom. We do not. And while we bring our request, we do so understanding we truly want God's way, not ours in our situations. Now, thankfully, we are not left to wonder what God's will is for our lives. You know, sadly, so many people spend their life doing so many foolish things trying to find God's will. People will look for signs. If my arm hurts, God doesn't want me to do that. If my arm feels good, God wants me to do that. If there's an open parking space, God must want me to go there. And people do all kinds of really crazy things trying to find God's will for their life. 
But seeking signs is not the biblical way to know God's will. The reality is when you approach God's will in that manner, you are really treating God like some sort of pagan deity who communicates through tea leaves or through signs in the heavens. But that's not the way God communicates to us. That's not the way He has revealed His will to us. He doesn't communicate through hidden signs. He doesn't communicate through aches and pains in our body. He has declared His perfect and desired will for us in the Scripture, in His Word. We have His written Word, and that contains His will for our life. And that's how we know if His will is being done in our life, by studying God's Word. If we are living in accordance with His Word, then our desires will be His. When we live in obedience to His Word, we can have the absolute assurance that we are doing His will. So when we pray the prayer, Lord, Your will be done, we are in essence saying, in essence saying Lord, I will live by Your Word, because that's how I ensure that Your will is done in my life. Now there are many verses that make it clear the types of things that are God's will for believers on earth. I'm just going to look at three such examples. But these are things that are God's will for your life. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is what His will is for you. And when we pray, Lord, your will be done, we are committing ourselves to submit to His perfect will. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 17, we read this. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. Verse 20. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. See, God's will is not hidden. It's told to us very clearly. God's will for us as believers is don't get drunk. Instead, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Sing songs to the Lord. Give thanks to Him. Submit to one another in the body of Christ. That's what God's will is for all believers, no exceptions. And when we pray, Lord, your will be done, we are declaring we want these things to be true in our life. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 repeats about giving thanks. We read, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, God's will for us is to give thanks in all situations. That means in the good and in the bad, we are to give thanks. Give thanks for who God is. Give thanks for the way in which God is working in and through us. And when we pray, your will be done, that means we are committing ourselves to be those who give thanks to Him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. God's will for all believers is that we avoid any form of sexual immorality. Now, the definitions of that are clearly stated in the Scripture. Any sexual relationship outside a man and a woman in the bonds of marriage is classified as sexual immorality. And that is something that ought not be in a believer's life. It is the will of God. So then to pray your will be done is to pray and commit ourselves that we will avoid any form of immorality because we want God's will to be done in our lives. God's will is for us to live in submission to His Word, to seek to live according to His standards and His commandments. So we are to be those who submit ourselves to His rule. We cannot pray, Lord, I know I'm committing adultery, but please keep me from getting caught. That's not going to work. You can't say, Lord, please make me smart enough to cheat my business partner out of this deal. Not going to work. You can't say, Lord, please protect me and keep me from getting hurt as I drive home drunk tonight. Those don't work. Such prayers really make a mockery of who God is. They make a mockery of what He requires. See, those type of prayers are, are not saying, God, your will be done. It's saying, God, my will be done and your will be ignored. Jesus makes it very clear. That's not the way we're to pray. We must submit to His rule. We must seek His face in our prayers. To pray your will be done means we seek to obey the Lord even before we come to prayer. And if you desire the Lord to respond to your prayers, then you've got to come as Jesus says to come. Come seeking to submit your life to His rule. Now certainly that doesn't mean you're perfect. None of us are perfect. We all sin. But it means that our heart desire can be expressed by that phrase, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means that if we see any area in our life in which His will is not being obeyed, we seek to change it as fast as we can. That's what it means to pray this prayer. Certainly all of us at times violate His will. But what is our heart? Is that what we want? Or do we seek to change and have His will done in our life? That's what it means to be His disciple. And that is how we bring honor to our King. We are to pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are to pray first and foremost seeking his glory and seeking his face. We pray on the basis of having a relationship with the Father. We are to pray having the proper respect to him. We are to pray being anxious for his reign to begin. We are to pray submitting ourselves to his rule and his word. That is how we are called to approach prayer as his disciples. It's fascinating that as Jesus taught us to pray, he first dealt on how it is that we are to have an attitude and approach the Lord before he tells us of how to make our request before the Lord. So often we flip-flop this. We get straight to the request and we forget to spend time in worship and adoration of who he is. And so we ought to remember, have the proper attitude and heart of worship. And I encourage you to take some time this week and meditate on this passage and evaluate your own prayer life and ensure that you are praying as our Lord instructs us to pray here. Ensure that there is a lot of your prayer that is focused on who God is, thankfulness for Him, commitment to live in a way that is in accordance with His Word and His will. Because that's the first part of praying as the disciple. The requests come next, and we'll get to that next week. Let's close with a word of prayer.